Okay, so folks, once again, thank you. Thank you for checking in. You know, every single day we're dropping content. We're bringing financial education, but also along the way, we're here bringing in guests that that share stories of of just what life is about. Like it's about it's about redemption. It's about acceleration. It's about getting knocked down. It's about getting off the canvas and being able to take that next step and that next move forward. And and what I've learned through my process is the people that know how to bounce back, the people that are, are or industries, or not industries, or teams or organizations that win multiple championships are the ones that know how to overcome adversity. And, you know, we always talk about that adversity is life's gymnasium. Today's guest is Ed Newman. I'm super excited about about being able to spend some time with Ed. Um, I recently met him through a, a joint friend of ours, you know, Chris Shampoo, Cohn Shempe, and I was blown away in the 20 minutes that we spent together, maybe 30 minutes at at your journey, Ed. And, you know, Ed, Ed is officially with uh, Raymond James on the investment banking and the healthcare side. The story that we're about to get into is incredible. Thank you for being on the show, brother. I appreciate yeah, it. Yep. Thank you for having me. My my first question is when we look at Ed Newman, where where did it all start for you? Like where are you from? Well, I grew up in Holland Park, New Jersey. Um, went to St. Joe's Metuchen High School. St. Joe's Metuchen, which by the way, uh, Jay Williams that played at Duke went there. Some other great players. Car Anthony Towns. He did go there. Okay, that's right. Um, I forgot about that. For some yeah. reason, I thought he went to Roosevelt Catholic. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So, so Carl Anthony Towns is you know one of the best players in the NBA right now. Went to Kentucky, but your school is like a it's almost like a North Jersey basketball rich kind of school, right? It has that blue collar approach. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, the program has been pretty successful from the time you were there to the time Jay Williams was there to the time that Carl Anthony Towns was there, and we're talking about over a thirty year time frame, right? What is it about you growing up there, becoming a basketball player? And Ed, if you don't mind, how tall are you? Five foot six. You're five six, right? So he's five six. He played at one of the best high school high school uh, programs in the state of New Jersey. How did that even get you there as a freshman? What was your early years like that made you even want to play basketball and then yeah. excel at this school? So sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I was a phenomenal basketball player, but just never grew. But yep. I was. You know, MVP of the Tri County League. Were you, you know, averaging like forty? I didn't have any forty point games, but uh, <laughs> it's hard to get forty in sixth, seventh, eighth grade. But uh, you know, was was a phenomenal player as a kid. And was your um, dad involved? Like, how did you how did you find how did you? No, find my parents from England. My dad was professor uh, wow. of engineering at Rutgers. They so, came over in nineteen sixty five. So it was a natural thing for you. He's a soccer guy. Right? Okay, so, so you I just... played soccer all my life too, but uh, basketball was my love. You know, there's a couple of people I know that play both sports, right? What this is a good point. So for for the basketball purists out there, how what was so good about soccer that translated itself on a basketball court? The first thing I'm thinking is conditioning, but there has to be some other things, footwork, whatever. Yeah, the case first may step, be. speed. Yeah, seeing the field. It's like okay. seeing the court. You know, you learn all those things young. Yeah, um, not watching the ball. What you know, moving the ball without, you know looking down you can see where where your next move is so yeah. a lot of chess like basketball it's amazing because one of the kids on the aau team that we have right now is a really good soccer player at cba mm -hmm. um who they have a very good program as you know in soccer um he's a he's a really he's our best most most um tenacious defender fastest kid foul line to foul line uh, really a game changer and and you know five foot seven right yeah so just kind of thinking through that so so now sixth seventh eighth grade you're good they tell you to go to, or you wanted to go to St. Joe's with touch. I wanted to go to St. Joe's because they had the best basketball program in Middlesex County, one of the best in the state. I thought I'd play there. We had my one of my eighth grade games. The varsity coach of the St. Joe's basketball team came, and he had a jersey with my number on it. And wow! He said you, you know, you're going to go here. To, you're, gonna, you're coming to St. Joe's, so I'm like, I'm in. So he was recruiting you at that point. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, basically. Like you know, yeah, 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 that was, but that was, that's why he was there. That's how good yeah, you were. Yeah. And yeah. I went to his camps and everything and he, he knew of me. So awesome. And, and my eighth grade coach was very close with him and his son went to St. Joe's. So. See folks pipeline, it's in business too, right? So when, when I think of pipelines and when I think of business, I think of relationship capital. It, you still have to perform no matter what first, last and always, but relationship capital for all you parents out there. It's so important that you really understand where you're putting your kids, not just drop them off, but understand where they are, who they're involved with, and how it could impact them two, three, four years later. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate yep. it. Yep. So now you're at St. Joe's. I get to St. Joe's my freshman year, starting the freshman team. 
you know, played my freshman year. Very different back then. Very few freshmen that I know of played varsity ball. You played varsity as a freshman? No. Oh, okay. No, played on the freshman team. Uh, sophomore year, playing for the JV team. Half Are you crushing it? Are you, are you, st are you still on your trajectory? Starting crushing, you know, 27, 30-point games I had during wow. the season. You know, I was, I was a good player. Um, my sophomore year, halfway through the season, the JV coach doesn't play me an entire game. The game before that, I had a 25-point game against a uh, team called uh, East Brunswick. Um, and we played him again, and this time we beat him bad. This time we lost this time. So I went to the coach afterwards and said, how come he didn't play me? You know, now, this was game. a first for you. Like, all of a sudden, they just changed up the just style. Changed. And he said, you got to understand, uh, coach, the head coach of the varsity team uh, doesn't think anybody under six foot can play basketball. So he wants me to start playing other guys that, you know, are going to play next year. You know, and let me kind of play with this a little bit because this is important for at least, and remember when we talk, I like to keep these messages simple for folks so they can kind of absorb what we're talking yeah. about because that's like a crazy, crazy statement. First of all, was it true that he said it or was this just the JV guy saying it? I think it was true he said it. The JV guy loved me. Okay, all right. Yeah. So assuming it's true 100%. Now, out there, limiting beliefs. And when you're young, you're exposed to what people tell you, right? Um, Mental strength must have been off the charts for you, but it must have been a blow a blow when you first heard it. I don't know how you felt at that moment. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I always heard from everybody that like, you're too small to play basketball. So it was a normal Why thing. Why don't you be a wrestler? You'd be great in wrestling. Yeah. You know, you can hear Eddie in the back. That's my stick with soccer. Laughing. Yeah. Yeah. Stick with soccer. So, Who's you know. a wrestler and he's five six? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but I love basketball so much, and that wasn't going to stop me. And I said, I, I was like, I'm just going to prove everybody wrong. Okay. So right so away, you hard. you shift. So all right, ready, entrepreneur, you ready for this? Listen, check it out. For you folks that have that that there's obstacles in your way, people telling you you can't do something. Listen to what Ed Newman just said. Five foot six at a very prestigious high school in New Jersey crushing it on JV, about to take that next step to varsity. Halfway through the season, he says, listen, the head coach says, no one under six foot makes it, so we're going to start limiting your playing time. I want you to think about that. Let that sit in to when it comes to your business, when someone says, you can't do this or you can't do that. And whoever you surround yourself, the top five people, they have an impact not only on what your money looks like, what your thinking looks like, what your magic looks like, and what your time looks like. So it's always important to be able to kind of take a step back reevaluate, shift the nervous system, and listen to folks like Ed that went through certain situations in times when he was at his best rhythm, and all of a sudden it didn't take him long to be able to take that, because he heard it already, and be able to kind of make that quantum leap forward next. Just give you one example. In seventh grade, I was playing with my best friend on the planet, this guy Jim Hobish. Um, he's a judge up in central Jersey. And uh, it was his eighth grade year. It was our last game, his, you know, together playing. And he says to me, uh, we're, we're warming up in his backyard before the game. And I said, hey, you know, let's go get it. It's our last grammar school game, but not our last game. We'll play together in high school. He says, I don't know, man. It's mm -hmm. going to be tough, especially if you go to Joe's, you know. You got to grow. Yeah. And that, that I was like, we will play together again. Yeah. So – and that might have been messages he was hearing from parents too, right? Like that Every, may everybody been, was saying, yeah. like he's super good, but you know, if he doesn't grow, yeah. you know, my brother was six foot, so they're thinking I'm going to grow up. You know, the coaches were thinking I'm going to be his size. Yeah. So anyway, I, my sophomore year, I'm like, I'm I'm going to another high school. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, my dad's like, now nah, you're going back to St. Joe's. Yeah. So I was freshman class president, sophomore class president. I was doing well. So I was like, all right, I'll show them. Yep. I'm going to run for vice president of the student council. And my buddy, Jim Hobish, was the president of the student council. What, what made you want to run for student council? Just curious. Was that part of your thinking or you just wanted to run for student council? It's part of the thinking. Like, you know, okay. I add value and, you know, I, I was always a leader. And yeah. I just didn't want anybody else doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. Right? And I want to be with my buddy, Jim Hobish, who was the president, right? So, yeah. so I did that and it was still debating because I love basketball so much. Should I stay here? He's not going to play me regardless how good I am. But between – that was probably like January, February. Between then and summer camp, the high school summer camp. Got it. I worked my ass off. So define what that looks like for, for an entrepreneur out there that has to bring it every day, process and self-mastery. Going out in the snow. Yep. Shoveling. 
with gloves on, a hat There's on. There's no indoor court you had access to. No. Yeah. No. I did get indoor access to St. Paul's in Holland Park. We'd go there, you know, when we could during the winter. But, um, you know, they gave me the key to go in and, and play whenever. Um, but, uh, you know, if I had an, an hour, boom, shovel, play. Amazing. Right? And just, you know, did everything, conditioning, um, was reading stuff, you know, that I'd given given to me in the past about different drills to be doing. Really? So you started reading too, get into your nervous system. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I had a book. I was reading, you know, just really, you know, focused, try to play any pickup game I could. You know, if I could go down to New Brunswick, you know, the next town over and play with the city kids. Wow. Just trying to, you know, master my game and knowing that when I go back to Riminette, I'm going to show them. And that was for the summer camp you're talking about. That was like a summer June, camp, July. high school summer camp yeah. where all the high school kids are there and everything. So he hadn't seen you since the no. season ended until that point. Yeah. Got it. So at the end of camp, he came up to me. He said, I don't care if you're four foot two, you're our starting point guard next year. What did you so, do in camp? I lit Besides it up. just dominate. Like, what, what was, were you just an offense? They couldn't stop you defensively. Like, what was what was the week like? I was a really good defensive player. I was, you know, I could see the court well. I was a great passer, great shooter. Um, you know, I just had a really good camp. You know, just really showed them that, you know, I'm the amazing. best guy out there. So, so I started my junior year. We had a phenomenal team. This is an amazing story. We had, our center was Jim Hobish, my buddy. He was a senior. How tall was he, by the way? 6'2". Yep. We had a swing forward, Steve Cumber, 5'10". Our power forward was 5'11", Mike Cannonello. And our shooting guard was six foot. Wow. And our shooting guard was this guy, Larry Bornheimer, who scored 30 points a game, was leading scorer in the state, without a three-point line. They'd put a triangle That's and two right. on him, and he'd still get 30. He's amazing, amazing athlete, still very close friend of mine as well today. Uh, great guy. So uh, we, you know, we... We were ranked number one in the county for like the whole season. We were ranked top five in the state. Wow. With that team, we were beating teams that were 6'9", 6'7", 6'6", inside, 6'4", 6'2". Just and full beat, court. Beat, full court press. Yep. We were smart. Yep. Very smart yep. players. Jim Hobish took lots of charges. We all took charges. You know, we were all, you know, yeah, any I, angle we had. I always say in basketball, there's nothing more dangerous than a blue-collar mindset of team that, that has high basketball IQ with good conditioning because mm -hmm. they're going to be tough to beat. Yeah. Right. They're going to be tough to beat. Yeah. And what I'm hearing with you is that I want to just kind of go back to that pivotal moment of February to Jan to, to June, you know, where you and we're going to use the words. What we do here is burn the boat. So when you burn the boat, you have no choice but to take over the island. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's what you did. You gave yourself no choice. Success leaves clues. It's a it's a sacrifice. You gave up a lot. Whether it was you know Fridays and Saturday nights, you know getting up early and reading the part that you were doing with the reading, that's a beautiful story. I mean, that's like I can't wait to share this with my son Riley, uh, who's a freshman at CBA. My other son Rob is a, is a sophomore. Um, that is amazing to me because you really gave yourself no choice, which to me was incredible. And and then you're as a junior starting on a team that's top five in the state. How yeah. far did you guys take it that year? So. We lost, I think, three games that year. One was in the counties, and then one was in the states, and the states one will, will never live down because we were up 27 at half. Whoa. And our coach went into a full 2-3 high stall. Okay. Which was took us out of our game. Yeah. And pulled off the, the press. Yeah. Just to try to burn time. Yeah. And that was not a good plan. Who, who but, was the team? Uh, they were... I think it was St. Joe's Tom's River. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Wow, it's incredible. Yeah, it was in the parochial. So, um, and you know that that junior year, I I played lacrosse. Oh, you did. And had a were you still playing soccer or no? Okay, done. That stopped. All right. I wanted to just focus on basketball. Yeah. That was it. So then I started focusing on lacrosse because I love lacrosse. It was a lot of similarities to footwork, speed, passing, everything yeah. similar. If you're a good basketball player, you'll be a great lacrosse player. Yeah. You know, it's just it's so similar. Instead of dribbling like this, you're cradling. Yeah, right? yeah. Same moves, same kind of off offensive setup, same defensive slides, everything. Wow. You know, it's very, very similar. Wow. So, uh, you know, I love lacrosse. Went to lacrosse camp during the summer, worked my ass off in lacrosse because I just fell in love with it. Kept doing the basketball thing. Where was basketball different. for you at this point, though? Like, like It was still it was, my favorite, my yeah. love, like by far. But I saw a future in So you were thinking this than, is my last year of basketball kind of thing? No. Okay. No, right. no. I was looking the next year. That's you what know, I mean. We're going to have, 
you know, we have some great guys coming back. Got it. Um, you know, we're going to, we can have a great season next year. So when I focused on basketball as much as I did before, but I, you know, I started really getting into lacrosse at that yeah. point. Um, I had a lot of work to do in lacrosse too. So, and I knew that was more of a future for me than, than basketball for college. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. And I wanted to be a college player. Yeah. You know? So, so my, my senior year, um, we had a great team coming back and the coach decided he wanted to play some younger guys, kind of rebuilding year. So it was a little bit different feel. He actually said, you know, he sat me for uh, one game uh, and said that, you know, I, I just came in, you know, backed up Danny Walton. Um, wow. Yeah, his – Danny Sr. I know son. Danny Sr. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. What year was this? So this was 86. So he – I remember he was, Danny. He was a year younger than me, yeah. I remember him. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So I'm backing him up and – you know, I love Danny. I was happy yeah. for him. Um, and, uh, you know, there's actually an article about um, how I just never quit yep. after that. Like a lot of the seniors quit because they got sat for younger guys. And uh, actually, I have the article. It's amazing. But, you know, I just kept fighting. Yeah. And it was a game against East Brunswick. They were ranked number one in the state. We beat them. Mm. They had a phenomenal team that year. and We beat them at home. Mm. And I had a great game. So they, they put that in the article. And then I was, you know, Danny and I split time the rest of the season. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was a great player. Yeah. First guy, no look. He was like a yeah. David Rivers type player. He I was, remember. He was really good. Um, I remember him at the uh, basketball camps in North Bergen with Coach Charlie. Yeah. Run, yeah. jump, and shoot it was called. North yeah. Bergen High School. That's when I saw him play. Yeah. Yep. Yep. His dad was good friends with Hurley. And yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Wow, dude. I love the, the different connections here. So, so basketball – um, the characteristics, right? You know, for me, and and I'm going to assume you, but for me, when I I earn no money as a basketball player, right? But all that basketball common denominator has allowed me to earn successful dollars in business, mm -hmm. right? Taking that approach, building teams, you know, even all the different things that we do, multiple businesses, the whole nine yards, meant to serve and contribute and really kind of help other people along the way. You as a as a not only as a student of basketball, but overcame so many different tangibles that I can't imagine what that did as you took the next step in your life. Now, when you got to college, were you playing lacrosse or yeah. what did yeah. that what did that look like for you? So uh my senior year I took a recruiting trip to to Rutgers, had a few others to some other colleges, but Rutgers was, you know, phenomenal lacrosse team. Um, felt like I could play there. Um, so I went, you know, and played lacrosse at Rutgers. Amazing. I was there all four years. Incredible experience. A bunch full, full of really great too? guys. No, no, no. Okay. no. Were they giving um, scholarships out? Yeah, they were. At that point? They were. Okay. Yeah, they would divide them up, you know, between you know a bunch of guys. But um, we had, you know, guys coming from Syracuse and Long Island. They were just phenomenal Monsters. players. Yeah. Every, like my my freshman class was there was six All Americans. Wow. And four of them were middies like me. So I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to play. And then the sophomores were the same thing. And, you know, so you're always fighting to get some time in there. Yeah. But uh, I didn't really see the field much until like my junior year. I saw some time. My senior year saw more, more time. But just the experience was phenomenal. Beating Hopkins at Hopkins my senior year, playing in the, the, the Dome up in Syracuse. So you really enjoyed the process. Hanging out with these guys. You really enjoyed the, being a part of a team oh, yeah. in the process. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's a lot of guys that quit because yeah. they weren't seeing enough time. Selfish, right? But I just not it's just not my makeup to be a quitter and just yeah. give up, you know. And I just so and I was having fun. That's really. what I'm saying. So yeah. for, so for you, the the internal calculation was I'm not going to quit. I'm, I'm going to just keep grinding every day. But you really focused in on the process. Yeah. Like you really enjoyed the process. Yeah. And were able to draw on past experiences on how to stay, you know. Because it's funny when I talk to my older son Rob, it's like okay, look. We got cut, right? So is the narrative we got cut or is the narrative we're going to shoot 10,000 jump shots over the next four months, you know, play in this one little summer, this little January, February league, but get into spring AAU and just play 60 games between March 1st and, and August 30th. And we're 30 games in almost, right? Yeah. So the team and, and the concept and everything that's been put together is how do you take what could be uh, perceived as a, as a death sentence because there's a label and now be able to kind of control the narrative, right? It sounds like you always wanted to control the narrative. Whatever whatever your internal heartbeat was, 
quitting just wasn't part of it. You yeah. know, rejection was just part of your overall process. Yep. And that was the stepping stone to your success. Yeah. Um, so I, I had the good fortune of sitting down with Ed and really kind of learning um, some really powerful things about him. And I, I'd like to kind of take that next step. And, um, you know, you, you're in college. I'm sure you've you, you had great relationships that may have led to your your next phase of life, which is a career that that I believe first started on Wall Street. Is that is that yep, correct? correct? Am I missing yep. anything? Yep. Started Lehman Brothers in 1990. 1990, right out of college? Right out of college. So Lehman 1990, folks, anyone that's an entrepreneur, that's all about, you know, fighting for a desk or fighting for your own space. And, and you know, just like basketball, there could be 50 people trying out. There's only going to be 12 spots. Can you talk a little bit about that, how basketball, lacrosse led to how you were able to start crushing it? Yeah, the first thing the first thing they told us in training at, at Lehman Brothers, uh, you know, they they get two hundred guys a year that go through this program, and about three of them are left. Yeah. You know, they can get it through, and I'm like, I'll be one of those three. First thing I said, because of sports, because of of practice, drill, and rehearse, because of daily discipline. I'm sure in Ed's mind, no different when I did four hundred dollars a day, that I knew that this was definitely going to be my 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 sandbox. Right. Because you could look and see the guy that leaves at four o'clock for happy hour that wants to impress the boss. You could eat him up all day long, every day, twice on Sunday. That's right. Just they taught you work ethic there, which I, you know, I fell right into because I really believed in work ethic yep. and knew it from sports. And there's some guys that just couldn't take the work ethic and, you know, be able to handle it. And, you know, I just kept driving and kept, you know, angling myself in the right directions there. And, and you could see their faces when they're about to quit. Yeah. Just like in basketball. Yeah. Right? That that you know, I used to call it check face. Yeah. Some people get their check and like be upset, but they didn't work. Yeah. That's why it was so small. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Check face. Yeah. So same thing in business though, where you're coming in with all these folks, two hundred people, and then as time goes on, another body goes out the door and it's a reinforcement that you're on the right path. Yeah. Me and a buddy of mine were in an apartment getting on the subway. We just looked at each other and we're like, it's like six o'clock in the morning. We're going to get beat up all day again in training yep. by all these guys and I, he just looks at me and goes, you know, I just want to be a gym teacher. And I said, yeah, me too. You just be like a bartender in the summers and a lifeguard. Yep. You know, and teach gym. Yep. And be a lacrosse coach or basketball coach. Yep. Right? Wouldn't that be so much more fun than what we're doing? Yep. It's like, yeah. But, you know, you turn it back up. Yeah. And you get out there and, you, you know, you do it. And the other thing, the same guy said, he's sitting, he's sitting right across from me in training. And he goes, can you imagine? He was an All-American lacrosse player at Roanoke. He says, can you imagine that we used to complain about going to practice with 30 of our best friends on a beautiful spring day in 75 degrees Yep. and work out and get yep. in shape? And we used to be like, oh, we got practice. Yep. Look what we're doing now. We're getting fat and stressed yep. out. And, you know, so just remember that anybody watching, any kids watching practices, you'll you'll know later. It's the best thing. So um, so anyway, I was there uh, for Got my desk, you know, 92. So from 90 yeah. to 92, you're talking about, you know, not nine to five, folks, to be clear. Nine, I'm going to say, I don't know, but I'm going to say eight in the morning till eight at night or six in the morning till six at night. Seven till nine. Yeah. So that yeah. was every day. You had to live in the city. With no yeah. money, right? No money. They didn't yeah, pay yeah. you nothing. Yeah. yeah. I think I made 12 grand yeah. like for, and then 28 grand my second year. I have a bag of pretzels and an orange for lunch because <laughs> it was cheap. Would never take the subway for a while. Just because it was to, you know, you could save it for beer money, right? It was just a different, different yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah. So 92, you get your own spot. Yep. So now building a business, um, 94, doing great. Now, are you married at this point? Got married in 1994. And you met your wife? My wife in college. Okay. So you, you were in a relationship. You had stability even during your, you know, those 91, 92, 93. Oh, yeah. I used to you, call her all the time. Yeah. She would, you know, she was great. She yeah. would just... She was like, don't worry about it. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, it's a good woman to have. Yeah, and her whole family. They were all really supportive of what I was doing. Is she uh, from your area? I yeah, know she, you met at Rutgers, but. Yeah, she's from Medicine, New Jersey. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. What's her name just for? Uh, Mary Newman. Mary Newman, shout out. That's it. Can't wait to the meet best. you. The best. Best, um, I'm very lucky. I know the feeling. Yeah. So, all right, so you got support, right? Yep. You, know, you know, now all of a sudden, wow, I'm starting to make some money here. Right. And yeah. what, what let's get into like what success looks like with an entrepreneur when it's measured by money. Yeah. So 
it was measured by money back then. Yep. When you first start making money, you're like, I made this much. Yep. So you just feel really good about yourself, yep. right? You learn later that's it's more yes. about the success. Yes. You want to be the top guy. You want to you want to you don't want another bank to do a deal that that you should have got, yep. right? It's not about the money, right? So you learn that over time. But back then, well, some people it was learn. more. Yeah. 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 But back then, yeah, it was like, all right, so I made this much this year. So in 10 years, if I you know, can keep growing how much I'm making, I can retire. So you were like you crushing know? it in 94. We won't get into numbers, yeah. but you were crushing it for all intents and purposes. Ready? So let's say 95% of, uh, you know, it's 150 grand. 99 could be like making, um, you know, like 500 grand. 99.99 is like all of a sudden you're at like 6 million. 99.999 is 56 million. So you're at the top 1% in 94, by the way, right? right? So now it's like, okay, you're on a path at the age of 25, 26 that, to your point, if this if this continues financially, you're good for the next 80 to 100 years. Yep. That was the mindset. That was the mindset. Then. Yep. So fast forward f four years later, um, as I'm f wanting to leave, I, I left Lehman Brothers in 1996 and joined Oppenheimer. The business was changing, right? There was a lot of changes yep. in the business, and it's particularly at Oppenheimer. I ended up saying, you know, I'm going to go back to Lehman. The, my old manager at Lehman said, come on back to Waters of Warm. We loved you. You know, should never left. So that week when I was going back, um, for a few months, I, was, I wasn't feeling well. Okay, so folks, just grab your pen and paper because this is where it gets interesting. <laughs> this is where, yeah. to me... This is where the story begins. But don't forget, success leaves clues. We could tap into different parts of our past that could help us through adversity when it comes to us seemingly out of nowhere. And there's never a calamity bell warning. No one's gonna tell you that a month from now, uh, a major challenge is coming and it's how you respond is the key. And, and um, what you're about to hear has made me a big fan of Ed. Okay. so. It was October 1997. I wasn't feeling well. It was going on for like a month. Fatigue. Couldn't stay awake. No, like a, like you're not used to being tired, right? No. You're, not, just, you're an athlete. You're, you know, 20, being tired and fatigued is not a normal thing to you. 30 years old. You know, so it's Any just, kids at this point? No or, kids. Okay. Just married, you know, um, at that point, like three, four years. L so, so she sees that you're tired. She sees it. Yeah. I'm just very fatigued. And, you know, you know, I'd still go work out, I'd be on the treadmill and feeling something like tight in my chest. I'm like, what's going on? I got to go to the doctor. So I go to the local doctor. Um, were you in the city at this point or were you in Jersey? I was in Jersey now, okay. living up in Atlantic Hollands up on the hill there. So you had the house. Boat. Yeah. Got it. So, um, you know, I go see a local guy and, and he's, you know, all he's asking me about is stocks the whole time, by the way. <laughs> um, what do you think of Oxford Health? I own that in my portfolio. You know, um, yeah, it was just, you know, he had ski journals in his office and, and golf pictures and stuff. And and he's like, look, you're too stressed out. You know, it was during the Asian crisis. And which I was remember the Asian contagion, 1997, yeah. the Dow went from 12,000 to 7,000. He thinks it's because of that. Yeah, yeah, he thinks because of that. And he said, look, go take a vacation and relax. So oh, me and my wife went down to see her brother down in uh, Ponte Vedra. And I just remember he had a New Year's Eve party. And I was like, I just don't feel like I can go. Like, and for me, not to go to a New Year's Eve party and hang out with my brother and everybody and have a great time, it's just something wrong. Yeah. Right. So I had like a low grade fever. So I called the doctor. And, and was your wife getting more concerned every day just based on your. She wasn't thinking anything really bad. She's just like, something's it. going on. Right. But um, so, you know, I called the doctor and he says, you know, you're stressed out. I Same said, doctor. I'm, I'm having a hard time. Yeah. I'm having a hard time swallowing. And he's, he said, dude, he gave me some prescription probably. So like, you're still stressed out even though you went away. You can't, you know, you have heartburn from yeah. being stressed out. So, okay. Fast forward a little bit later, it's just getting worse. Uh, I end up, you know, and I was one of these guys that would play hurt. Yeah. Right? I never not want to be on the court or on the field. Yeah. You know, no matter if it pulled hammy, whatever, I was out there. Yep. So I would go to work. So I, I went to work this one day, you know, got on the boat, went all the way in. Um, and my whole face was like blown up. Just that day, like that day. That day, red, got all it. red. And I was having a hard time breathing. It felt like my collar was choking me and I like buttoned it all the way down. I'm like, why do I feel like something's choking me? And this is like 30 so, days into the fatigue kind of thing? No, we're talking like October till wow. uh, 
end of January, early February. So, all right, so you four months now. Yeah. Okay. So right. I've been fighting through this thing, just yeah. trying, just saying it's going to go away. You yeah. Know, when you're that age, you know, yeah. don't worry about nothing. So, um, and you think you're indestructible. Yep. So, uh, one of the girls in our office um, was worried about me, and she went talk to another broker there and said, you know, we got to get get you know he's got to go see somebody. So, I went to see a doctor, Doctor Glassman, NYU. And, you know, he took me right away, laid me down on the table, said, come up, came up. He goes, you got something blocking everything. Yeah. So I want you to do a CAT scan. So, all right, go do a CAT scan. He's going to want you to stay overnight. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm going home, get a car home, you know, not yeah. staying. No one likes staying in a hospital. No, but yep, I would have been the same way. So um, go home next day. I remember sitting on the floor doing taxes, getting ready for him. My wife's sitting there and he calls and he said, He's like, you got tumors all over your body. Oh. He's like, you know. Tumors all over your body. Yeah. Tumors all over your body at the age of 30. Yeah. He said, uh, there's one that's around your aorta that's choking your aorta. That's why the blood flow is not coming down, up and down, back from your head. Fatigue? Is that why it created fatigue? It creates or? fatigue, everything. Yeah. Right. So it just got bigger and bigger and it was choking it, choking the aorta. So he's like, you know, you got to get in here right away. So went in. Yep. What's that feeling? That moment. That was hard. Where's where's like like what yeah. are you thinking? I don't know where it's going. Yeah. Right. And I just knew whatever it is, I'm just gonna, you know, fight it as hard as I can. Were you in that mindset right then and there? Like did you yeah, go pretty right much. back? I to remember like, saying to myself, too Stop, short. don't don't start going that way. You put go, the tape. go the positive yeah. way, right? Got it. But I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Really? Because I felt I looked and I was like, Oh, you're sick. You know, Got it. You're bad. So uh, always remember that. So anyway, I go in uh, into a NYU. Um, so I started. Uh, so they you know, chopped me up biopsies and um, come back, you know, two days later. And the doctor, Grim Reaper, comes in and says, you know, it's not good. He said, look, you, can, you have two choices. You just don't get treated and just make it comfortable. Or we can go through nine months of what's called CHOP. Uh, you get chemo, radiation over a nine-month period, but with your type of disease and how much disease you have, it's probably it may not be successful. I said, no offense, I'm going to s setting this up for a couple of days, going to Sloan Kettering. Uh, they were doing a trial there. Wow, it was called. Uh, so you already had you were already working on a backup, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. While you were learning this, who, why did you did someone tell you to do that, or did you do that on your own? Pretty much, there was a guy at Oppenheimer named Jason Ginder. Okay. Um, shout who, out to Jason Ginder. Big shout out to him. Yeah. So uh, that's amazing, he, right he there. I didn't Hodgkin's, know that. He had Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had non-Hodgkin's uh, DLBCL is what I had. Um, and so when Oppenheimer called, they said, um, "You know, how can we be helpful?" I said, "You know, I know Jason, who was like one of the biggest producers at Oppenheimer, um, had Hodgkin's, and you know maybe you can talk to me." He called me up, and the first thing he says, "You got to get out of there, get to Sloan Kettering." I give him a ton of money every year. I'm going to get on the phone with Dr. Yahom and and, and Dr. O'Brien immediately, and have them call you. They called me right away. It's, they're like again, you're, systems of and people saying, around your kids, right? They're saying you're, you're 30 years old, you're cur you're curable. And we're doing this study called NHL 15, which is basically just very high dose chemotherapy. Because in the past, they couldn't give high-dose chemotherapy because they didn't have Nupagen, which increases your white blood cells. Okay. They didn't have really good anti-nausea medication. They had, you know, so you couldn't get through all that high-dose. So that was the trial that they were doing. And he's like, you got to come into the trial. I'm like, okay. So to back up for one second, I, I, called, my, I, I called Lehman Brothers and told them, you know, what happened. Yeah. I said, but I think it, I'll, I'll get over it in a few months and I'll, I'll, I'll be there. He said, well, I'll get better and then come. I'm like, oh, crap. So Oppenheimer calls and says, um, you know, what can we do besides the Jason thing? Um, I said, look, I need a salary. You guys kicked me over and I'm on full commission here and I'm not going to be able to work for a while. So I, and, he's, and he's like, well, what do you need? I said, you know, like 30 grand a month. And he's like, all right, well, I'll call back an hour later and said, done, 30 Hold grand on. a month. Guys. Can I, can I yeah. do something amazing? So what happens is um, relationship capital, honesty, hard work, um, coordinating and being able to listen to know when crisis hits, who's in your corner, 
And it didn't just show up for him. It's because of all the things that did um, that people had his back in a moment when his life was on the line, including financially and including from a health perspective. Um, amazing. And Lehman Brothers, you know, I'm not making, I'm not saying anything about them, but they weren't there for you when Oppenheimer was. And I think that's an incredible story. Yeah, um, and that doesn't that. happen on Wall Street. No, it doesn't. It's not normal. So it was not normal, and, and, and I was surprised. Not, not, I'm not picking on. Yeah, your primary doctor did, did he did he get a call at any point during this time? Or oh yeah, he did an X-ray when I was there, and it was clearly on the X-ray, but he must have not looked at it because the the docs at He's, NYU saw it. Did you say like sorry? Like, do you, like no, no, and I wasn't really going to chase him. You know, I well, learned that. Just curious. Yeah. I'm I'm just wondering, like in the sequence. That's all. Like yeah. So, I, I mean, I learned, like, don't go see doctors that have ski journals and, and golf journals in their offices. They have medical journals and publications, and they're an expert in some yeah. area, right? Yeah. In one area, right? So, <laughs> but anyway, the, what Oppenheimer did. Oh, my God, it's so crazy. What Oppenheimer did for me, I think, you know, might have saved my life. You know, one of the reasons it really helped me because I didn't have to worry about you financially. You're not worrying about on. money when you're going and, through and this. And you have a job yeah. at the end of it, and you're fine. Just focus on your disease. Yes. It was a home run. Amazing. Yeah, so amazing. Yeah, so I ended up doing that NHL 15 study. And you attacked it like basketball. You attacked yeah, it like right lacrosse. Ahead. So, the other thing. So, Jason Ginder was a big supporter of mine the whole way through. And he introduced me to John Ellis, who was an ex Yankee catcher, a uh, phenomenal guy. Um, he, John called me, like, the, I was at, still at NYU, called me, and he said, it was great advice. He, he said, Look, you sound down, man. You sound down. He goes, you can't, you can't walk into this with your – you're going into a fight with Mike Tyson. Mm. He, Mike Tyson was big back then. Yeah. Right? And if you walk in there with your hands down, your head down, he's going to knock your block off. He's like, you got to get in there and just get through the 15 rounds. Stick he's going to knock you down, stick and move, you know, just get through the 15 rounds. You're going to get knocked down plenty of times, get right back up. I had that in my mind the whole time. Yeah. Your so wife, 100%, the whole support. Oh, she was, yeah. she was a nurse, so yeah. she was Even phenomenal. Better. Yep. She was with me, you know, the whole way. Yep. Thank Getting you. Getting upset. Nope. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah. So um, I think we didn't have kids at the time, too, because she could do that as well. And her whole family, my whole family, you know, I'm one of five, she's one of five. And, yeah. you know, we're all tight. So that was great. Thank you. Um, so we, you know, I went through the the, the first trial. Um, looked great. They got it down. Is that three months, nine months? What is that time frame? Uh, that, was, that was about five Four, uh, it was about four months. Got it. it should have been three, but I, you know, they get, I got hit so hard I couldn't get chemo the next time, so I got pushed off. Um, I had to go in for weekends to get the, the treatment. You know, it was, it was, it was tough. I mean, it was nasty. Like, yeah, you like, just kicked your ass, right? Is that what you mean? Kicked your like, ass. You just were at home and were you walking around? Was it like reading? Yeah. You listen to audio tape. Like, what was? So at thirty years old, I, you know, I would say this. You know, I tell my buddies, I'm like, this is like you just drank. A fifth of the worst vodka in Got the it. world the night before. Like the Every next day. two days, you feel like oh, crap. Chemo. Got it. Yeah. yeah, from the chemo. It's just like that's what it feels like. So, um, three days you're not feeling well, really, and then then you get you know you start feeling a little bit better, and then they hit you again. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, I finished that. Um, looked great. They said you're in remission. Great. Went home. I had to come back like a month and a half later <clears throat> for a checkup, and I thought I had to get a chest X-ray for some reason. I had in my mind, I'm supposed to go get a chest ray. I went down, you know, the basement of uh, Sloan Kettering, went and said, I, I need a chest x ray. And they're, they're like, well, we don't see you in you know, order for a chest ray, for, a chest wow. x ray for you. So they called up, you know, to the lymphoma group and they said, give him a chest x ray, you know. So yeah. I got it. <clears throat> I went back up and saw my doctor, uh, Dr. O'Brien. And he's like, your blood work came back great. Everything looks good. He felt me everywhere. He says, you look great. I said, how did the chest x ray come out? And he said, uh, you had a chest x-ray? Why'd you have a chest x-ray? You didn't need a chest x-ray. I said, I thought I was supposed to get one. He goes, all right, let me go check. Hour and a half later, he comes back. Wow. Yeah, he's like, he walks in, he's like, it's not good. You're... Is that how he said it, though? Yeah, he yeah. said it. it's back. Um, and did I'm they like, okay, now what? Yeah. So he said, the only thing we could do is a transplant. Really? Like, what's that, right? Like, what's that all about? So uh, he's like, well, basically, we just give you... A tremendous amount of chemotherapy, like a 24-hour drip of the nastiest chemotherapy we can for 10 days. 
and we give you four radiation, full body radiation treatments a day for 10 days, and we wipe out any fast growing cell in your body, which cancer is a fast growing cell. Yeah. So that's why you lose your hair when you get chemo because it's a fast growing cell. But you're gonna lose your mucous membranes, you're gonna lose, your blood is gonna go down to zero. You're gonna be getting transfusions every day to survive. Mm -hmm. So, and it was in a, I was in a trial for that. It was called stem cell transplant. So I went into that. Um, that was... What was your... Wh where were you mentally? I was like, you know, I hope I survived this thing, you know? Wow. And I just... So did you, Jason... Did you become... Sorry. Yeah. Did you become friends with other people that were going through the same yes. thing you were going through? Yeah. Do you that want to share any of that? That or? passed during it, yeah. 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 I mean, I met a guy from Puerto Rico. Uh, he came up from Puerto Rico. His wife was there. He had two young kids my age did he make it he didn't make it no. Rest i would peace. sit there in a wheelchair waiting to get the radiation treatments we, you know talking to these guys they'd be yeah. like next in line and you go into this room to shut the door and mm. lock you in there and just big jet engine comes out you put you in a harness and it's just it's crazy so yeah it was a, it was a you know crazy experience my wife was in the room with me the entire time thank god she watched everything made sure i was she being knew, taken yeah. care of and yep. everything um you know i was in there basically four months. And this was after that 10 day, this was the second go around? You yeah. 10 day and 10. 10 day and then they got it, then you get, you know, then you got to come back. Okay. Right. So they give you an induction first, then the nasty 10 day, and then you got to, they don't let you go home got after it. you're done. You got to, so I was getting six transfusions a day. So that was the hardest. Period. Yeah. Oppenheimer sent hundreds of people up to give blood, you wow. know, so it was nice. Yeah. I loved you, man. They were great. That's amazing. Yeah. I um, love you. They did. And, uh, you know, J Jason Ginder had this guy he knew that was a Navy SEAL that wrote a book. He sent me that book. That was that gave me drive. That's awesome. But what their training was, their missions they did. Yep. So, you know, when, you know, I, I would get the rigors, the shakes really bad, and they give me like 100 milligrams of... Uh, of uh, Demer Demerol and knock me out. And before and I would go, go Navy SEALs. Yeah. So, <laughs> not knowing if I was going to come back afterwards, but oh my uh, God. yeah, it was, wow. it was nuts. And it took me a good year. So, like, so you survived that part. I survived it. The got test out. came back. Te it, you know, and it, it takes it with my type of disease. It's, it's so fast growing. Yeah. It would come back pretty quickly. So they said like after three years, they call it a cure. Okay. Definitely at five. So I had to get to, through those three years. They lost a lot of people there. This is 1998. Got it. Okay, yeah. so 2003 was your mark. 2003 was my mark, yeah. exactly. Got it. Um, but, you know, as, a, as anybody that's a cancer survivor knows that it's never that mark. You, you know, you're just waiting for the next time that's going to hit. Yeah. You know, so you're, and it, I, we talk to cancer survivors all the time. They're like, I just, you know, even though I've been out 10 years, I feel like it's going to come back. Are you, you know, part so. of any group? Are you, are you like in a group no, just that? a bunch of guys that I know that are cancer survivors and and, and stuff. So, so can, look, can I ask a question? Because yeah. your education on this particular part of cancer that you have is is probably incredible. It's now 2022 versus when you got it. I think it was in 1996. Has the treatment from then till now? Is it a different treatment? Is it a much higher success rate or? Oh like, yeah. What does all that look like? Oh yeah, they've got it down a lot better. Like I, I, I was, you're in for maybe six weeks for a, a transplant. These say eight weeks, um, depending on your age and how much they give you. They've refined it. They have many other drugs they okay, can so use they, today. They've created a really good system. Yeah, like CAR Ts and things for for lymphomas and stuff. So th there's a, you know, your own immune system is 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 boosted to work against the cancer. Right? Got it. So got it. A um, lot of a lot of progress there so this was like archaic stuff there the caveman stuff and certain people yeah. didn't do the trial the way you did either right like you yeah. you you did a trial i was in a trial yeah, yeah. there was uh 78 of us i went through it, through it and there was nine of us left after three years wow so in that trial it's published great you know and, and you it was were with oppenheimer the whole time yeah it was with oppenheimer wow. yep so um i came out you know it took me a while to recover then i John Ellis calls me up from the ex-Yankee catcher I was telling you about. He started a foundation called the Connecticut Cancer Foundation. At the time, it was Connecticut Sports Foundation Against Cancer. And he had Hodgkin's lymphoma. His brother and sister both died of it. And his dog died of lymphoma. Wow. So he always likes to say that. Yeah. So he, too, he's a survivor. And he started his first um, uh, money-raising event was at a diner in Connecticut with Mickey Mantle, Whitey Ford, 
and um, uh, Billy Martin. And, this and it was in. five dollars to come, and they'd sign a ball for you. Wow. Imagine what those balls are worth today. Right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, he he. That's how he got going, and and he's raised now millions and millions of dollars uh, over the years, and uh, so he's like, all right, time to give back. Yep. I yep. want you to be. You know, I want yep. you to come help the Connecticut Cancer Foundation. Is that the that you're still part of, or is it we're going yes. to a different? Okay. Yes. And, and, so, yep. so what? You know, I was in 14 different clinical trials, right? Two, two drug trials and 12 clinical trials. So what I want, what I had was a, a research assistant that I could call her 24 seven. She would take down everything that was going on with me yep. continually in these trials because she had to put the whole publication and all the data together at the end saying this is how we treated this guy yeah and how we treated these 78 patients or or the 12 patient study i was in or a 15 patient so the money that they need is just for having that research assistant yep. which is really an advocate for you as well she would meet me and take me to my appointments and it was Got great it. to have her so i was like you know i want to do that because the, the, you know if they can if they can make treatments less toxic Right, because that's what the doctors told me they want to do: less toxic and, and more effective and more efficacious. That's a home run, yeah. right? And as you can keep going that direction, eventually make it chronic. Right. Yep. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fund that. So I said, John, that's what I want to do. I want to fund the docs at Sloan so Kettering for the research. And an you had a yeah, specific. I want to do what they did for me. I want other people to have that experience. The same benefit that you know ended up surviving. Right. So. He's like, sure, okay, go ahead. So then I figured it out. Like, it's so hard to start a charity, and you got with the IRS and everything you got to do, and they have accountants and lawyers and you know on their staff, and you know. So he's like, look, we will start a research arm at Connecticut got Cancer it. Foundation. This way, nice you raise the money, it'll go to there. Yeah. Well, you're part of our foundation, and it's specific to what you want the money to go for. It's it's yeah. what your desire is. Yeah, is that the whole point? That's the whole point. You got it. Okay. So I joined the, he had me join the board, which was great because Yogi Berra was on the board and Don Zimmer and a bunch of other really great guys. And, you know, they do a big dinner at Mohegan Sun every year where they raise a million bucks up in Mohegan Sun. And, you know, they have all the Yankees there, Jeter there. You know, it's, it's a real great experience. And, and you started this what year? Were you, did you join? 1999. Okay, got 1999. Yeah. Oh, so you still were like in remission. I was just out. Yeah, I was got just it. out. But I was like willing to do anything, give yeah, back, to whatever give back. I do, fund the docs because I'm gonna might need them, right? Yeah. So all that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I totally get that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, absolutely, I yeah. sit on the board of Clara Moss. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. So um, they were wow, they were great, incredible. Yeah. And you're still at Oppenheimer during this whole time, and you yeah. Know. So I I, ended, I started Oppenheimer in 1996, and I was there 19 years until wow. I left and joined Raymond James uh, seven oh, years ago. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So the story, by the way, folks. And the journey has been incredible so far. Let's let's kind of reiterate and recap. And remember, you could always go ahead and click the link below. If you have any questions, feel free to ask questions. If you want us to do other videos, if you want me to do more videos with Ed, let me know. But at the end of the day, this is about serving you in so many different ways. And I want you to think about what we're talking about. Um, sports growing up, and you don't have to be in sports to be an entrepreneur, but the discipline of sports, the discipline of practice, drill, and rehearse, the discipline of not only practice, drill, and rehearse, but really at a high intensity. So like, I'll give basketball terms, I could sit here and shoot 300 jumpers standing still, or I could do it in game speed, and if I do it in game speed, I'm gonna be better off. Well, that translated into college, which then translated into a job on Wall Street, financial success, boom, gets hit with cancer. And by all accounts, um, a very deadly version of it. If he was already late acting on it, um, had some good people that rallied him from one hospital to Sloan Kettering, went through some horrible yet, um, you know, trial periods that led him to get onto the other side. And the whole time, Ed can't wait to give back, right? Can't wait to be part of, uh, create his own division within this foundation, which he's been doing, as he said, since 1999. And you probably think the story ends there, but it really doesn't. Yep. It's just about to begin. And this is where I want you to start taking notes. So, the, where we go from here, I don't know the rest. Yeah, You know what I mean? I know some of the highlights of the rest because I've personally seen them, but I don't know what's about to happen next, and I'm real excited to hear about it. Yeah, so uh, all good. The journey's all good from there. Ups and downs, as everybody has, but it was all good. Um, so obviously through all the treatment I went through, I couldn't, we couldn't have children. But I, 
I banked sperm. We tried that in vitro. That was really hard, emotional, didn't work. Uh, so we, we felt like adoption was the right thing for us. So um, in 2001, like in the spring of 2001, we actually went down to Arkansas uh, for uh, a uh, baby that was uh, born to a, a mother that was living in a car and just mm. couldn't, wanted to you know, give up for adoption, God bless her, um, which is the right thing to do in my mind rather sure. than doing aborting. So um, she, you know, we had to stay in Arkansas for 10 days and she ended up changing her mind on the 10th day. Mm. That was hard. Mary was breastfeeding and, you know, spending time with you know your daughter right yeah. so and you got to give it give her back and you can't offer her more money or anything because that just will come back to bite you because you can go to a judge and say they, they bribed me right so we had to leave we had mm -hmm. to get out of there we, we stayed another week hoping that she changed her mind again it didn't happen so but you know everything that i learned through cancer was things happen for a reason yeah. no question and you know you nobody gets to through this world without suffering right? that's right we know that so i was like here it comes again all right so but in august we get a phone call uh there's a girl out in topeka kansas that wants to give her kid up for adoption and she picked you from the portfolio you and your wife and so that was another journey so we this time we went out and saw them first you know and met them and everything and Girlfriend, boyfriend. Was she? Did and she give birth already, or was she? Just no, pregnant? no, no. Okay. She's pregnant. Yep. So, um, and then we get the call. She's, you know, a month early, and she's like, "I'm, I'm gonna have my baby today." So we flew, we flew out there. So our daughter came. Um, she was a preemie. So we were in the we were we were out in Topeka, Kansas, for a month. Um, you know, with the birth mother and the birth father and their family. And, How was that? You know. It was it was great. It was yeah. it was they, they, they a, it was an experience. They were good with the decision. Like they were, they struggled a little bit, you yeah. know, here and there. But at the end of the day, that they 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 knew it was the right thing. Yeah, you know, she already had a, a daughter, and you know, they did really didn't have the means to you know to take care of her. So um, it was an experience, you know. So we were there, you know, for that month. And then finally, we we drove all the way back, and um, so that was you know my daughter coming. Which what year? Was, that was two thousand one. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Right after 9-11, actually. I was going to say, yeah, 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's born in November. So, November uh, what? 20th. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm November 2nd. <laughs> I was at whenever I hear November. Yep. Yeah. So, you so, have a daughter. Yeah, so that was, right? That's Things happen for a reason. Yeah. I mean, can't imagine my life without her, right? Yeah. So, God was like, no, no, no. This is the plan, right? Yeah. So, so now, you know, we got her and... We're a year and a half. She's a year and a half old, and we forgot that we put her name on in Catholic Charities. Um, mm -hmm. And we get a call from Catholic Charities and says on a Thursday and says, "Hey, you you came up on the list. Um, some eighteen year old girlfriend boyfriend. Uh, they can't take care of you know their baby. So the, which know, state you, was this? Where, where was this? New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. Oh, okay. Local, yeah. like to us or Tom's River. Okay. Yeah. So would you, you know? Can you come? It's a little redheaded Scottish boy. Can you pick him up on? Sorry, on Sunday. Mm. So sometimes you know when God's calling, right? It's like tap. Yep. And we had we were renovating our whole bottom about. floor at the time, and yep. it was like, how are we going to bring a baby in here? And like, it's never the right time. Yep. But it was God calling. So that was another, you know, huge huge blessing. Yeah. If, if anybody knows my son, uh, he's amazing. So, uh, Matty but, Cools. Yep. It was, you know, he's been a challenge because he's autistic. You know, we've found that out when he's got diagnosed at 14 months old. Mm. Um, but wouldn't trade it. Yeah. Wouldn't trade it. He's phenomenal. You know, you know, we wake up every day just looking forward to seeing him, you know, yeah, and spending time with him. He's, he's a great kid. So, that that you know ups and downs along the way with that you know autism so is challenging. Landed Highland still the whole time. Is that where you live in, or have no? You we moved? we moved to Fairhaven for Matt because they had an incredible program there for you know kids like Matt. And you still live in Fairhaven? Kids. No, I live in Rumson. Okay. I um, so, um, you know, we we moved to Fairhaven, and the school there was tremendous with him. The kids were tremendous. Cool. Your sickles and then Nolwood. My daughter goes to Nolwood. That's why I was asking. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So uh, they were just really good to him. The kids, you know, 
um, based on like Beth Keith that works there, yeah. child study team, just had the kids like circle of friends and making sure they include him and and get to know him and know how to deal with kids like like Matt. Yeah, and you know people that are watching this, um, I because I know folks that have had kids like Matt that the parents didn't put them into the system where what you're describing and it's a different outcome than when there is that it sounds like everything in your world whether it was basketball growing up uh whether it was oppenheimer whether it was the doctors on on sloan County, you've always had like a board of directors around everything you did i'll use that that's my that's the only thing i can think of right now and that's no different than what matt experienced with you know the public school and the level of attention that they put towards kids that have, you know, what some would say challenges, others would say gifts, yeah. right? Yeah. I'll use the word gift here because the story of Matty Cools is a legendary story, yeah. right? As yeah. I was able to see in the last six months, not really knowing that well, yeah. um, except in the summertime when I would go down to the D-League. Yeah. <laughs> incredible stuff, uh, including him coaching. Um, but, yeah. you know, the journey's incredible. And, and and now all of a sudden you have two kids, you're in, you're in Fairhaven and, you know, you're dealing with life on life's terms. You have a daughter who's older than Maddie, correct? Mm -hmm. And how was that dynamic just going through the process in grammar school, high school, and you know where it is now? So, what you mean with Cece and Matt, yeah. the, the relationship? Or, yeah. yeah, so yeah. she's like the second mom in the house, and yeah. she loves him, and he, you know, he, he loves her, and they're very close, um, but she's always, she's always on him, yeah. you know? Like on him to, I'm like, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah. You're supposed to talk this way, not that way. You know, like, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, always, you know, always got our back helping. She's always got her eye on him. She's, you know, great sister. Yeah. Um, she's a really good kid. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been wonderful. Did I'm she play blessed. sports, by the way? Yeah, she did. She what did. did she play? She, she was a uh, field hockey and softball. Her, okay. She loves, loves softball. She's a great softball player, but she was a better hockey player. She was a goalie. She was great. Yeah. I thought, you know, they had a great team at RFH. She was really good. Yeah, she's into sports and everything too. And, you know, Matt's into hoops, obviously, because of me, I think. Well, but, hold on. So let's talk about that because this is great. Yeah. So there's a story that, and I don't know the whole story. I just, you know, Shappy shared with me a story. I, I love to hear how it unfolded. But um, RFH was in the middle of a great upset, as I understand, here in the county championships. Maybe I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And Matt was a fan of RFH basketball. Is that? Oh yeah. Is that correct? Oh yeah. And do you want to share um, how he wound up going to RFH or the whole basketball dynamic? Yeah, he was heading to RFH either way. But um, he loved going to basketball games and. Um, I, I was taking him to the high school basketball games because all the, of them are just RFH, just RFH. Ones. Okay, so yeah. that he was married to RFH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're and was Shempy there already at that point? Shempy was there. Yep, yep. So, so for other folks, so Shempy, Coach Shempy, Chris Shampo, he took a high school that probably won its last state championship in 1973 that really didn't have a good tradition in basketball, and completely just changed the DNA of Rumson Rumson basketball and RFH basketball to the point where they're a multiple state state champion and. Um, obviously they won a county championship in an in a, in a, in a upset, massive upset. What I would say about Shempe, from my perspective, is that, now look, you could measure coaches and wins and losses in championships, right? We know what the legendary coach Bob Hurley did. We know that he won 28 state championships. We know that he was in 13 tournament of champion finals. We know that he's won at least six or seven of them. I forget what the count is at this point. Uh, but we know his TSC record, meaning when they made it to the Final Four, he was 27-1. and one. Legendary. But what I like to say about Shempe, and I love your input on this, is the kids that come through there, the character that is built, and what happens afterwards while he's winning county and state championships, I would put him up there pound for pound and say he's one of the best coaches out there. That's yeah. just my opinion. If I yeah. factor in all of the different components of basketball. Including what he gets out of each player, no one's mm -hmm. dunking from the foul line, right? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. No yeah. one's doing back, you know, dunking from the, you know, from the hash. You know, what is that? Some years he's lucky to have a dunker. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. However, their 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 blue collar mindset, even though they live in a white collar bubble, right? Yeah. Blue collar mindset, lunch pail, high level basketball IQ, commitment to team, is incredible. Yeah. And and I'm just like catching wind of that over the last nine months. Yeah. So that's my thought. If you could share your experience and yeah, you know how it's tied well, into Maddie, including some some national, some national yeah, press yeah. that happened this year. So you know, 
Shemp is a great basketball mind. First of all, he knows basketball is he's up there with Hurley, right? He yep. especially he knows high school basketball, but he's just a phenomenal basketball mind. So you get a really good basketball coach, right? But there's a lot of really good basketball coaches out there that don't do the other things. Yeah. Right. So off season. He you know, he never cuts a senior. Yep. I mean he had nineteen seniors on the team this year. Yep. Thirty players. The biggest bench and they ha- he does all these things with the bench so the kids have a great time during the games on the bench and and they he gets them involved in every practice and all those things like you know all the you know teaching about family you know character um no one does that by the you way you know attitude on 3 like attitude uh all the things that he puts on on the shirts you know about hustling about toughness about you know things that you learn it carry through your life yeah. right and good coaches are are not only good at teaching the game yep. and teaching the how to play and, and character, but it's maximizing character. But yep. but all the other aspects that he did, um, you know, he's he's always looks out for you know he's always looking at the last guy on the bench or the guy that you know maybe isn't the most popular kid in the school or maybe has an issue or something like he did with my son. So we were actually at the state championship at RFH. They won, you know, whole place goes nuts. We're walking out on the floor, just kind of heading out. And Shemp just comes over to me and Matt and he had met me and Matt and he, he, he knew me from friends and things like that. Um, but he met Matt a couple of times and he knew that Matt was on the spectrum, yep. but he didn't really know him that well. So he's like, Matt, you want to come in the locker room? He's like, come on, drags him, take, takes him into the locker room. Matt's in there. I'm like, I don't know what's going on in there. I just know Shemp's doing something. And he comes out and he says, I'm, I'm the, uh, Matt says, I'm the basketball manager for the next four years of RFH. Wow. He's in eighth grade. Wow. So, which is just great because Matt loves basketball. So, uh, you know, Shemp went in there and told the guys and they all started chanting his name. It wasn't Matty Cools yet. That yeah, I was going to say, what is that? Is that? That's a name that they made. He's cool. Matty's cool. Is that like- yeah, so... Uh, Shemp names yeah. every every kid has a nickname, and there was a Matty Ice already. Matty Ice, yeah, that's right. Got yep. it. Okay. Victory Park Tavern. Yep, yep. Uh, his parents own that. Uh, so there's a Matty Ice already, but um, you know he's like, you know, I was thinking. He calls me up. He's like, I think a great name for him be Matty Cool. I'm like, yeah, it works. Whatever <laughs> you know, because he's good at that stuff, right? So um, that's how it got started, and he took Matt under his wing. Yep. He made it, you know. Every kid on that team just loved him, treated him, you know, like a king. Yeah. Right. And the kids just said to me, Matty can't do anything wrong in practice. Like we do, we talk or anything in practice, Shemp, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, Matt gets away with everything. Yeah. Just lets him do whatever. I'm like, oh, he's, you can't let him get away. So, uh, you know, he, he's just been terrific for him. And so, you know, they did a, a thing a sophomore year. They did a, a, a local video on him, was great. Um, and then it was senior day uh, this year that, you know, Shemp got him into the game start. And it was against Homedale, right? It's against Homedale yeah, yeah. at RFH. And, uh, you know, Matt, you know, scored his first bucket. Yeah. And uh, which was, you know, amazing. The whole place went nuts. They had yeah. Matty up on his shoulder and uh, it, was, it was a great day. Matt was ecstatic and, you know, our whole family was there. It was great. So, uh you know, it, it was in the papers and it got yeah. a lot of press and everything as these things do, right? Yep. And I got a call from NBC, from the producer there, and says, we're gonna do a, a story on, you know, your family and Matt and wow. um, so it's okay, you know. Um, at first, we were like, maybe not, you know, it's too much, but you're like, you know what, it'll be good for, for everybody to kid. see, er, right, yeah, exactly. just like when you were doing with the foundation. Yeah, and it, and it you know, they have eight million viewers of of that yeah. NBC nightly show, so it's all, it's all throughout the country. So we're like, all right, so we di- we did that, and he was on NBC nightly news, and it was fun. The whole team, we all went watching a rest- local restaurant here, and Man, that's awesome. It was it was awesome. It's an amazing journey around, yeah. brother. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So what is it for you, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we still got another 40, 50 years left. What does it look like? What is your what does your next, you know, five or ten years look like? What do you want to accomplish that you may not have yet? Or what is your purpose? And I understand with the foundation, mm-hmm. like, what is it? You know, what's driving you to this day every day? So I learned at an early age that you know 
we make a plan and God laughs, you know that saying, <laughs> yeah, right? Yes. Right. So absolutely. So you should make a plan, right? Yeah. Anyway, but you know it's going to get sidetracked. And daily goals are really important to me. Like every day, what am I going to do today? What am I, you know, just you know, thinking about that day yeah. and that hour, that you know, what you're doing, how you're doing it. Um, you know that that's how I live my life from the the situation I went through. Yep. Um, and I don't know. I have no idea, but. What the future brings, yep. but I know if I'm working hard every day and I'm doing the things that I've, you know, I've done, the habits I have, and you know, things will be fine. So we were talking earlier about just on the business front of things. So we were talking about money back then was more important, you know, at how much am I making, yeah. right? And that that was what your value was, yep, right. Good, um, exactly. Yeah. When I got sick, I was, you know, I was literally at three o'clock in the morning during the transplant, looking out of the hospital window going, I, I just want to be a bum on the street. I just want to feel good, you know? I, I, don't, feel I, don't, better. I don't need anything. Yeah. I just want to feel better, right? Perspective. And the, the perspective starts coming about every day and, and, and you know, how pe- everybody suffers. And, yep. it, and I learned that if you suffer in life, there's a few things that you need. Number one, you need, you need some faith, whatever it is. Yep. You know, I'm Catholic, but whatever it is, whatever faith you have that you're in somebody else's hands and you can rely on and you can pray to, whatever that is, and that there's some other thing going on here. Um, and then you, you need you need good family and friends. I mean, because yeah. they'll get you through anything. It didn't matter how much money I had. That's right. Because if I had zero right. and I needed money, my family and friends would be like, here, yeah. help them out, right? Yeah. Now they got GoFundMe. Anybody can raise yeah. money, right? So, <laughs> yes. You know, but it is a difference. Yep. So, you know, stay close to your friends and your family because when you're going to hit suffering in your life and when you do, and multiple times normally, yeah. most people, it's not once, yeah. right? You know, a loss of a parent or yeah. your kid or, you know, a close friend, you know, those are, or, your, you know, things that happen with yourself. So, you know, having that, you know, having the faith, having, you know, good friends and good family, and then believing in yourself, right? Yep. Just always believing in yourself. Never be, question yourself, um, I think is, you know, really important, even when you're you're going through something difficult. You, you, just, you know, it's a good point. So I agree with that, believe in yourself. But mm-hmm. is there certain rituals or certain things you do when, when fear does creep in? Is there like a... Is there like a, like a, you know, do you stand up? Do you walk around? Do you do an incantation? Is there anything you do to overcome some, <clears throat> excuse me, some limiting beliefs that could kick in out of nowhere? Uh, I just go back to this. Um, I always, I just don't care, right? Yep. When the fear comes, I'm like, what am I worried about? I don't yeah. care. You know, whatever yeah. happens, happens, right? Yeah. It's just acceptance. Acceptance, yeah. right? You know, going into a meeting in front of a board and pitching why they should use us. Yeah. And going in there. And I'm like, you know what? I, I just, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Just be yourself and do your thing, right? Because when yourself, it. good things happen. Yeah, exactly. So if, yeah. for the folks that are watching, though, is there, how do they look at your foundation? How do they have access to that information? Is there a website? Is yeah, there... so it's the Connecticut Cancer Foundation. Um, <clears throat> if you could look it up on the web. Um, you know, we have a research arm there. Um, I do a golf outing every year. At when Rumpson is that? Fair, it's August 8th, Monday, August 8th. Yep. At Rumson Fairhaven. Um, sorry. Rumson Country Club. Um, so it, it, you know, there you can you can go to the link uh, on online to, to sign up. Um, and I just, you know want to say one other thing. Yeah, no, take it. This is your about. Um, so when I when I was sick, I had a lot of time to think, mm. right? And that's a, what I tell a lot of people. You got to give your time to th- time to think about yeah. what you're doing. I had. A good year and a half to think mm. right i didn't have to work i didn't think of what i wanted to do and what i what i got passionate about was helping biotech companies and and drug companies you know some way that i can help them by you know raising capital you knew they needed more money. trials yeah. they needed money for their trials yeah and they have they have burn rates that are you know above average of other of, of the other industries i assume so yeah. you knew that if they had money they could go through the success process to help people that are in your shoes. Right. Was so that, was that the... So it was the, the charity side and then that I thought I could be very impactful on. If I could really learn that business and yeah. know how to do that and, you know, build the relationships with the, the funds that invest in those in those companies. So you had that clarity. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, I had a lot of time to think, right? Yeah. So that's the other thing. It's like, you know, you got to, you know, you got to clear your mind. You got to think about, 
you can't make quick decisions. This is where I'm going because did, it sounds good. Right? Did you have to pitch people on that idea, or was yeah. it like a natural? Did they get it right away, or was it something that you had so to kind I, of? When I came, it was fun because I come back to Oppenheimer and I go to the head of healthcare investment banking, and I said, "This is what I want to do." He's like, "Whatever you want to do, I'm just glad you're alive." Right. Wow. So it was good. Um, so I was Amazing. able to, you know, he, he's like, "Sure." So I, I just took companies out on the road and. You know, I call them up, say, we're interested in your company. Um, you know, I want to do a non-deal roadshow for you. Come meet some funds. Mm. I want to make one invest in your company. I get to know the companies well. I get to know the, the funds better, um, build relationships on both sides. And that's how my whole career went is just continually. Uh, and it worked right away, right? Like the whole, the business side of it sounds like it worked. It worked. Yeah. yeah. It like, worked. Putting those two together yeah. and. Um, you know, and that's, you know, what I'm still doing today. Wow. And, and it's, and it, again, it's not just so much about the money. It's about doing this and having the passion for it and helping companies and, and, you know, and also competing, competing against other banks. Use us, not That's them. what you like. Yeah. So, so it's funny. Tony Robbins always says this, right? And, and this is what I'm feeling as you talk to me right now. It, someone could say they want to make $10 million a year, right? Versus someone that says, I want to make 10 million because I'm going to deploy it here, here, here and here and the art of living is giving which will create not only growth contribution but be able to do it over and over again and it sounds like once folks go from the 10 million to the 10 million to be deployed everywhere else that's where the real the real fulfillment comes into play yeah. right that's where success not as a monetary and by the way there is a monetary value to it it just it'll show up for you at that it'll be a byproduct but that's where success is really measured at such a high level from a legacy perspective, how you're impacting the world. And, you know, even if you touch one person, what it does a generation later, if that person has an impact on the world. Right. Yeah. So so that's what I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying about what you're saying. And I get the money, you know, from one part of our life is way different if, if we evolve. And if we really understand, it's not about a scarce mindset, but it's an abundant mindset because we stand for financial education. Mm -hmm. Right being able to help the middle class as well as the upper class and also be able to provide education for folks that are not financially mature yet. Like mm -hmm. that that's what it's about. But money's just a tool to really be able to help make the world a better place, right? Yeah. And if it's done the right way. And stories like yours are amazing. Totally, I, I wanna thank you so much for coming in today, Ed. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited to see where this takes us. And uh, once again, Ed Newman, uh, you could check him out. Um, on, on all the different, you know, you'll be able to see his link below or, or be able to have access to who he is and what his story has been. Um, but entrepreneur, um, business owner, corporate executive, somebody that's working nine to five but wants to create their own business at night, there's no shortcut. Um, practice, drill, and rehearse daily and be able to improve on a daily basis. If we grow 1% every day for 365 straight days, we don't have a 365% growth because there is an exponentiality. We're probably growing by about 4,000%, right? <laughs> so I want to thank you, brother, so much. Thank I really appreciate you coming thank in. Thank you, Rob. Look forward to, to, to learning more. Yep. I'd love to be able to be part of the golf outing. Definitely. And um, that's it, man. Thanks for checking in, folks. And like I said, link click the link below. If you have any questions, add questions. If you want us to do other videos, we'd love to do other videos as well.